Um, so my presentation is called Foursquare Map. This is my approach to writing historical fiction. Uh, so uh, I'll introduce myself. Who am I and why am I flapping my gums here today? So my name is Michelle Butler Hallett. Some people call me Shelley. You can if you wish. I'm the author of five novels and one short story collection. My newest novel came out this spring. It's called Constant Nobody, and it's set mostly in 1937 Moscow. Now, all of my fiction I've learned wrestles with history and or alternate history. Alternate history is a whole other conversation, which I'm not gonna get into today. Me, I'm a history nerd. I love and see the study of history as far more than dates and battles. Uh, it's the study of history is the study of humanity, and that's what I'm all about in my work. So it's a, it's a nice fit. So why historical fiction? Um, I kind of fell into this backwards because I thought I was writing, you know, fiction. Uh, turns out I was really naive about marketing labels. Um, and historical fiction is certainly one. I find I get many of my ideas for stories from reading history. It's, it's a hobby of mine. I've always got a, a, a history book on the go. Uh, historical fiction Yes, it's fiction, which has got some kind of historical background, but it is very much a marketing label, the same way that crime fiction can be, that literary fiction, especially as is practiced in Canada, can be. Um, now, just a bit of theory here. I argue that all fiction is historical, which gets me kicked out of the best coffee shops. I say that all fiction is historical because even if it's written in the present tense, right here, right now, it is created in a historical moment and it will at least eventually reflect its context. Now, even stories set in the future do this, like um, say a long lived franchise like Star Trek demonstrates the context of its creation. And I'm thinking now about the original series of which I've been rewatching for the first time since I was about 20. Um, and you can see the context, you can see the 1960s most obviously in the attitudes of the characters and in the technology they're supposed to be using. So in the late 60s, we've got this, we've imagined this future, everything is cutting edge and amazing, and we can hardly understand it. And this is the computer on the enterprise. As we all know, the computers we use right now are just like that. They sound like adding machines and are probably spitting out cards somewhere. Oh, wait, Mr. Spock, we're done with you. So you're probably thinking, I came here to talk about historical fiction. I really don't care about the future, Michelle. And I'm going to be snarky and say, sure you do, from what you plan to have for supper to how you plan to deal with climate change. But sure, right now, we want to discuss writing fiction that is set in the past. And that's, that's the definition of historical fiction we can use today. I'm going to invite you to chew on this idea. Whether we set our fiction in ancient Greece or the 23rd century like Star Trek, we are on some level and in some way writing about our, our own historical context and worries. Okay, I'm, I'm going to say that again. Whether we set our fiction in ancient Greece or in the 23rd century, we are on some level in some way writing about our own historical context and our own worries. We're going to come back to this idea a little later. So writing fiction that's set in the past, what is this four square approach I use? Now, before we go any further, I am not here to tell you how to write historical fiction, okay? I'm not here to tell you how to write your novel. It's your fiction. You have your own ideas and your own voice. I am here to show you a few things that I figured out for myself that might help you with your project. And it may not. Why do I say map? Oh, I think I've skipped one, hang on. Now, what does the term four square even mean? I came across it uh, when, uh, through Seamus Heaney's translation of Beowulf, and it means steady, solid. And it's often said of a building, like a castle set four square on the hill. And it might be said of a leader, um, like Beowulf. I can't think of any current leaders I might approach, I might apply that to. Um, for me, a four square map for fiction is steady and solid. And I really need that. It helps me deal with a lot of my anxiety and imposter syndrome and everything else. Four squares that can also overlap and create one layered square 
or combine to create one larger square. So it's a clever metaphor. Wow, ain't I smart, but it works for me. Why do I say map? Guys, because without a map, I get lost. Seriously. I have a terrible sense of direction and my spatial thinking is weak. And if I'm landlocked, I have no idea where I'm going. It's, it's embarrassing. It's really embarrassing as a novelist when I don't know where I'm going. And that gives my editor a hard time. Now, if you're lucky enough to be published and to be getting published and have a relationship with your editor, be nice to your editor. Do not cause her any more pain than is necessary. Now, if your editor is a complete tool, that's a whole other conversation. But let's let's presume it's going to be a great relationship. Okay. So maps, pants, and plots. Some writers love not knowing where they're going. I used to be one. Alistair McLeod, I heard him call it being in free fall. And it can be really exciting. Like you're just sitting there, the words are flowing out your fingers. You're really not sure where it's going. You might be in the zone for hours at a time and not even know it. Um, and then sometimes you might also sit down later and you can't do it because that free fall thing is not happening. Sometimes that style is called writing by the seat of your pants and writers who work that way might get called pantsers. Those of us who outline are often called plotters. Now, maybe you fall somewhere in between. Like I said, I used to write by the seat of my pants and I made a lot of structural mistakes. I had to rebuild novels from the ground up, just tear everything down, start again. Now, I really like my maps. So what are the four squares? Now, you're going to quickly see here that these, all these parts of storytelling overlap. And I find when I'm working it up, I can leap around from one to the other back again. So I divide them into one, macro and micro conflicts, two, plot and character, each driving the other, three, setting and sense, and four, plot and story, how they differ and how they connect. I'm just going to go over that again. My four squares are macro and micro conflicts plot and character, each driving the other, setting and sense, and plot and story, how they differ and how they connect. So what am I getting on with, with this macro and micro conflict stuff? All right, the terms macro and micro do not have to represent importance or scale or assumed value. I just use these terms for my own convenience. Now, for example, when I was working up the settings for my last novel, Constant Nobody, I considered the big social and political forces affecting my characters to be the macro conflicts. And they included, one, the British Empire and how it liked to police the world, I mean, protect its interests in 1937. Two, the Spanish Civil War in 1937. Three, the Russian Revolution of 1917 and subsequent civil wars as backstory. Four, the Great Purge in the USSR in 1937. Five, the state of the Cold War in 1957. And six, espionage and how it may have worked in all of these fields. So these are the big social and political forces which make up the setting and settings and which are going to definitely affect my characters. So what are the micro conflicts? For me, they're threefold. One. How does each of these macro conflicts shape each character's sense of self? So how does each of my characters feel about the social forces affecting them? Are they loyal, doubtful, apathetic? Are they somewhere in between? And three, what are the interpersonal conflicts within the context of the macro conflicts? I'm going to say that again. That was a mouthful. What are the interpersonal conflicts within the context of the macro conflicts? So you have your characters who are affected in different ways by the, by, by the social and political forces. How do those forces affect their views and the way they behave when they come into conflict with another human being? So in Constant Nobody, I had to answer the following about my two main characters. And these questions I consider to be the micro conflicts. And they are, how does USSR citizen Kostyanikdo feel about his role as an NKVD agent and his recurring duty to torment and kill people? Because that's what NKVD agents did. Two, how does British nouveau aristocrat Temerity West feel about the British Empire and her role within its intelligence service? And three, how do these very different people 
from very different backgrounds interact when they are thrown together in Moscow during the Great Purge. Now, this is where I start to get into plot and character, how each drives the other. Some authors are going to tell you that their fiction is very character driven. That's fine. Some authors, their fiction is very plot driven. You'll see that in some of the genre fiction, um, action, adventure, romance, whatever. That's also totally fine. For me, the ideal is when the two of them are almost inseparable. So well, plot and character, this concern uh, will flow from considering your macro and your micro conflicts. Now, in Constant Nobody, Kostya experiences increasing doubts about his role within the Soviet state. And he also houses Temerity, an enemy agent in his flat in Moscow, which is a very dangerous decision that could easily get them both killed. Temerity has her doubts about the empire, but feels she can negotiate her own sense of duty within it. As an ambitious woman who was often underestimated, hello, 1937, hello, right now, Temerity is also willing to take some big risks. Now, this behavior is one of the things that helps throw her together with Kostya in the first place. So we have here a very dangerous situation. A Soviet NKVD officer is hiding a British spy in his flat. Now, why has Kostya done this? Because he is tired of death and because his emotions, long suppressed and denied, are waking up. So the plot is starting to affect his character there. Temerity understands the danger she's in, but she must also wrestle with the fact that she is a captive. She's smart and tough, and she negotiates whether she is a personal captive to Kostya, which was really never his intention, but that's how it's playing out, or whether she's a political captive to the realities of the Soviet state. Kostya and Temerity also have feelings for each other. So stakes and tensions rise, character is driving plot, and plot is driving character round and round and round. When we get into setting and sense, again, we can see a lot of overlap here between, uh, between your world building, developing your setting, and understanding the macro conflicts. Uh, this part from me can take lots and lots of research. Did I mention the research? I, I, I get much of the research for my setting and sense done while I'm researching the macro conflicts. So I'll just tuck little details away. So where do I go? Um, source documents are ideal when possible, okay? Letters, diaries, newspapers, whatever, written by people who lived at the time and in the place of your story. This stuff is gold. You gotta bear, bear in mind two things, is that people don't necessarily talk the way they, they write. I'm pretty sure the Elizabethans didn't go around speaking in blank verse all the time. And the other thing to be aware of is the writer's social standing, their likely education and any political biases that they may have. For example, um, a byline in Pravda, uh, you know this is propaganda, you know there are all kinds of things influencing what's, what's being said there. Uh, similarly, I'm doing a lot of research now into the into a small town British newspaper in the early days of World War II, and it's very gung ho. Britain is wonderful. The empire is great. Uh, historical surveys are also incredibly um, useful. Don't be afraid to ask a librarian for help with that. Or if you're re researching some aspect of your story on Wikipedia, check out the footnotes. Uh, other novels set in the period can also be incredibly helpful, uh, give you some ideas. Um, if you're, if you're, 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 you're writing fiction where you really want to observe tropes, that's, that can be great. Just don't rely on other novels for historical accuracy. Now, when I say sense, I'm referring to the sensual details of everyday life for your characters. And I, I don't mean their sex lives. I mean the sorts of details they may not even think about. For example, like how does it feel to lug a pail of water up from a well? Who's the water for? Is it cold? Is it warm? Is it heavy? How does it feel to put on Liesl stockings, which would be scratchy and thick? Why is she wearing them? How does it feel to milk a cow? And for constant nobody, I had to learn how Kostya might feel holding a Nagant revolver, a very frightening weapon, or how he might feel just, just physically, never mind the emotions, physically clipping off his hair. I had to, to learn how Temerity dealt with her menstrual periods and what cosmetics she might use. 
So for the sense parts, I researched, among other things, soap, perfume, cologne, hair pomade, shopping bags, furniture, and doorknobs. Yes, doorknobs. The doorknobs are very important. So plot and story. How do they differ and how do they connect? A lot of people use plot and story interchangeably, including the writers I'm about to refer to. I don't. So let's go to novelist Kate Weinberg. She tells of meeting John le Carre, uh, David Cornwell, when, he's, when he was at home, and getting some advice. And you got to remember here that Weinberg and le Carre both are using plot and story interchangeably, OK? So Weinberg says, I was struggling. And she, and she, she was talking directly to le Carre. Whenever I think of story, I lose the characters, I told him. And whenever I think of character, I lose my story. I'm going to go over that again. I was struggling. Whenever I think of story, I lose the characters, I told him. And when I, when I think of character, I lose my story. Now, I don't know about any of you. I have been in that situation many times. Lacari's response, you need to remember this. The cat sat on the mat. That's not a story. But the cat sat on the dog's mat. Now that's a story. Now, I argue that's plot, uh, but he's absolutely right. Who's the cat? Where's the dog? How does the dog feel about the cat on the mat? Why is the cat uh, doing this beyond the fact that cats are jerks sometimes? This plot, by the way, is 100% cat approved. Uh, this is Callista. She's a very grumpy cat. Now, do you remember when I earlier when I, I showed the very 1960s idea of a future computer from an episode of Star Trek, the adding machine, the lights flashing, chunka chunka? There's a lot of anxiety in that original Star Trek series about computers replacing humans and about humans becoming perfect and thereby no longer human. So some of this anxiety is also about the Cold War. We're, we're talking the late 60s here. And an, an American cultural fear of being assimilated by... <gasps> those godless commies in the Soviet Union. Uh, we can compare this to the Borg in Star Trek Next Generation who are absolutely terrifying, of course, because nobody, I don't think any of us wants to lose our humanity, our identity. Our ident identity is so important to all of us. Now, the plot of such episodes in the original series where, where the writers are really anxious about computers, uh, the plot might be how Kirk and the Enterprise crew defeat a computer threat. The story however, is much more tangly and reflects the creator's contexts and anxieties. So those episodes, the story is the Cold War. The story is, the, is very much rooted in the context of, of, of the creators and their specific historical moments. The story is also about identity, which is a much broader thing and, and encompasses all, all of history. But the plot is computer threat, how do we fix it? The plot of Constant Nobody, for example, is what happens when two enemy spies meet and develop feelings for each other. Sounds pretty simple. Uh, the story of Constant Nobody, I like to think, is a little richer. The story of Constant Nobody is love, tyranny, duty, and identity, which are things I worry about as an individual here in a specific historical context. And the story is also the human cost of massive political forces like the Soviet Union and the British Empire. It's also a story about the roots and meanings of the Cold War, a macro conflict which shaped my childhood and adolescence and caused much anxiety. I'm 50 years old. I'm sure any of us old enough to remember the Cold War can, you know, that dread, the bombs will fly at any moment. Everything was on this knife edge. It was both terrifying and numbing at the same time. So plot and story, how, how am I keeping them straight in my head so if, if I'm making this distinction? My head, I only have one head. So one way I consider plot versus story. Plot is what happens to my characters in their fictive world and why. Story is what it all means, both to my characters and to my audience in this historical moment, and I hope any audience in the future. I'm going to go over that again. How I consider plot versus story. Plot is what happens to my characters in their fictive world and why. Story is what it all means both to my characters and to my audience. Now, you may not intuit or understand your historical novel's story, as opposed to its plot, right away. 
And that's fine. Once you do, you can start revising to best effect. Are there pitfalls to writing historical fiction? Oh, God, no. Easy is, uh, okay, I'm lying. Historical fiction can be intimidating. As I don't know about you, I find history itself intimidating. And the research, again, it could be years of research. I could spend the rest of my life researching uh, everyday life in 1930s Soviet Russia and still not learn everything. There are academic scholars who are devoting their lives to this. Where do I stop if I'm writing a novel? It's, it can be really hard to figure, to, to figure out that point, but you got to remember that if you don't stop researching, at least um, I have to remember, if I hadn't stopped researching at some point, I would never have finished writing the novel. And for me, this is why a structure can be so helpful. I find I can manage my research, thinking about my four squares, and I can also see where I have holes, where I have to go back and check something, like the doorknobs. So uh, you're going to have to ask yourself at some point, and only, only you are really going to know when this is, at some point, who's in charge? Okay, the history you research must begin to serve your story. If your story is serving the history, which can be endlessly fascinating, then you risk not writing a novel, but a compendium of facts. Now, anybody else out there who's read Moby Dick, those incredible long digressive chapters are wonderful, glorious and rich. A lot of people hate them. The facts can be quite fascinating in and of themselves, and they may well enrich the setting, which um, I would argue is, is what Melville was trying to do. But is it at the expense of developing character or plot? Okay, and that's something only you can answer in the end, because, like I said, it's 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 your novel, and this is a very these are very subjective responses we're talking here. So back to the four squares. Now, over and over and over, I have to haul myself out of research rabbit holes and related anxiety. I can't write this. I know nothing. Well, well, well. I'm very intimidated by my current project. So when I get into this mess, I have to focus again on my four square map. One, the macro and micro conflicts. Two, plot and character, how each is driving the other. Three, setting and sense. And four, plot and story, how they connect and how they differ. Now, I said earlier, I am not here to tell you how to write historical fiction. And I can't guarantee my four square map will solve any or all of your problems. But it really helps me. It's taken me a long time to, to work this out and boil it down. And hey, if we can't help each other, then what's the point? Uh, I wish you all luck and satisfaction in your writing and I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, thanks. That was awesome. Um, Thank you. Are there any questions? I have a, there's a practical question. Uh, Lindsay's yep. asking if um, people can get a copy of your slides because they're excellent. Oh, thank you very much. Yes, I would be happy to put up a link to it. I just did it in, 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 Google, in Google Slides. Um, give me a minute to play around and try and get that because you saw what happened earlier. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm no expert at this, but, but, but yes, if, if anybody wants, wants a link, I'm happy to share it. Great. And I see hey, Lindsay. I'll has ask a... another um, less practical question too, if that's cool. I'm here. <laughs> um, I was just wondering uh, if you can see a big difference in your books where you have used this method and where you have not. That's not only attributed to the fact that you've read, written multiple books and uh, I assume gotten better over time. I like to think I've gotten better over time. Um, the first, uh, my first novel as a is narrated by an American psychiatrist who's in Newfoundland off and on working under the MK Ultra from protocol. And I didn't have a structure. I kind of, I, I managed to come up with a beginning, middle end, you know, the, the, the great three parts. This is where I started, started to think about it. It took me a long time to get that novel into any kind of shape um, because I, for me, again, it's, it's a weakness I got. I didn't try to structure it properly. My next novel uh, is called Sky Waves, and I went, I went a little burmy with the uh, with the structure there. That one is not in 98 chapters. They're all interconnected, but they jump all over the timeline. And I call the novel a Drew because a Drew is the row of a fishing net with those 98 meshes. 
oh, I'm so clever. Um, I'm still proud of that novel. I did what I wanted to do with it. I think maybe five people read it. So I, I can't, I began to think about not accessibility as much as I'm, I want to write to communicate with people. So why am I putting up barriers? So then I, I began to, to subsume my structure a bit more. Uh, I could see, I was still struggling in Deluded Your Sailors. By the time I got to this Marlowe, I was, I, I was really starting to boil us down. And yes, this Marlowe and Constant Nobody were very difficult to write, but they were easier in, in one way because I was using this, this map. So the, the, the short answer is yes. Sorry about that. No, no, that was, that was great. And I really can't wait. Uh, I've got most of a novel done and I'm really looking forward to looking back over it with these four different squares in mind. Well, one thank at a time. you. Yeah, thank awesome. you. Uh, Angela, you have a question. Oh, thanks, Michelle. I just wondered if you have any pet peeves when you read other writers' historical novels where you think they went wrong or... I don't give anybody a hard time for getting details wrong because maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. Um, if I see something that's really jarring and I'm 100% certain it's wrong and it knocks me out of the spell, I'm just sort of, I shrug it off. Um, life is too short to really go picking at, at other people's work like that. There's also the question in historical fiction of when and where might you be taking liberties, uh, which I have done um, in both This Marlowe and Constant Nobody. Uh, historically speaking, for example, Christopher Marlowe's older sister, he was a second child, uh, died when he was four. I've got her living into adulthood because I really wanted him to have a relationship with her. Um, some people might look at that and go, that is a gross violation of the historical record and, and, and throw the book over their shoulder. That's not the kind of reader I am. I try to meet a novel, especially where it is. I try to understand what, the, what I hope I try to understand what the writer is accomplishing. And especially the first time I read something, I just want to sit back and tell me a story. I'm yours. So no, I don't really have any pet peeves. Oh, that's great. Uh, Amy, I see you asked a question in the chat. Is, is it the same question? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm just going to ask the same question. First, yeah, I typed it. That was great, Shelly. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, how far could or should you go in pursuit of those historical sensorial details? Because you know I'm going to end up in a coal mine here. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I'd say a good 80% of the details I research and tuck away, I never use. Because if I was gonna put if I was gonna put them all in there, it would start intruding on the story. It's that is such a subtle and subjective judgment call. Research to your heart's content. If if if, if you're setting something in a coal mine, get down in one if you haven't already. Read as much as you can. I'll I will not follow you. I'm terribly claustrophobic. I hate being in mines. Um, you know the um, and smell everything and and if you can weave all those details into a scene as a, when something is happening or or into a reverie for your character, I mean that's that's great. But how far and when to stop? That's up to you and possibly with your editor. It's a, it's a really hard call. So I, I have no useful advice. I'm really sorry. No, that is very useful. I got to go in a call mine. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I see Lori is asking, tell me about the doorknobs, please. <laughs> the doorknobs. Locked doors are very important as an image pattern and as a, and as a, a sort of a, a thematic beat in this novel. And most of the setting is taking place in a very new flat in Moscow. And so I had to figure out how the doorknobs worked. Would they be old fashioned ones? How, how were the keys? Because Temerity does not have a key. But our doors, our, our locks, we can open from the inside and go out. So I had to find a kind of doorknob that was being used in 1937 that was fairly new and stylish that you absolutely had to have a key to use. And that took me a long time. I did find them though. If I hadn't had the doorknobs right, then I, uh, she could have just walked out of that apartment anytime and I wouldn't have a story. Um, Kurt had a comment just in response to your um, what you were saying about how you read and that you just kind of want to sink into the story. He said that's the suspension of disbelief. Um, yes, yeah, I do that with uh, sci-fi and everything too. If I'm re reading or viewing something a second time, I may start to pick it apart, if only to pick the stitching because I'm very interested in other writers' techniques and how they put things together. But that first time, it's I'll I'll probably accept just about anything that's on a page or on the screen, frankly. 
there has to be joy, I think, in storytelling, and there has to be joy in 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 reading and 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 watching stories. I have a question. Yes, <laughs> I'm just gonna step in here. Um, who are who are what is what is a question that you always wanted to be asked, but no one ever asks you in a talk, <laughs> or something that you want to talk oh. about, but people don't bring up enough. That's good, yeah. Fortify. Hmm. <laughs> I, oh, you really caught me on the hop with that one. <laughs> if there's nothing, that's okay. But... No, I, I'm sorry. I, I, I really sorry. I can't think of any, of uh, of anything there. Yeah, no, that's that's probably good. That means you're getting asked the right stuff. <laughs> Okay. Does anyone else? Oh, um, Rosanna is asking, have you always written historical fiction or another type of writing? Like I said earlier, I thought I was writing fiction. I thought I was writing literary fiction. Um, didn't realize that literary fiction in Canada is, this perception is changing, thank God, and not a minute too soon. But for a long time, lit what got called literary fiction in Canada uh, was, um, use only realism as a narrative technique, um, set as close to the present as, as was possible. So sometimes I think we have real audacity in labeling anything literary fiction right now, because we, uh, what we, you know, um, if, if I look at a, a pile of books here next to my shelf, I see Chekhov, Flannery O'Connor, Christopher Marlowe, and Anna Ekmatova and George Orwell. Now these are all writers who have lasted, they have lasted in, in, um, in Marlowe's case, uh, centuries. Um, I would consider these writers to be literary fiction. It's good stuff, it's important, it tackles the, the big questions. But how can we tell in the publishing season for 20, of, of the, um, of, say the spring 2022 publishing season, we call it literary. How do we know it's going to last? How do we know it isn't? It, it isn't any good. It's it, it it bugs me a lot, and um, sometimes I get looked down on by the literary crowd because oh yeah, you do historical fiction, <laughs> and sometimes the historical crowd are like oh I thought you were literary. So that's that's weird. Um, I think I like to think I've always had my own voice and own own vision, and I, I have have stuck with that at all times. How it gets slotted in our market is probably not up to me in the end. <laughs> that's a that's a great segue into the next question, which is: Have you found that marketing historical fiction is hard if the setting is not North America or Canada? Uh, yeah. My last two novels, uh, one was set in 1593 England, and Constant Nobody is set mostly in Moscow in 1937. And because I'm from Atlantic Canada, specifically from Newfoundland, there is an expectation that I'm going to write about the region or I'm going to set everything in Newfoundland. It's a running joke I've got in my books that are not set in Newfoundland that it gets mentioned somewhere, usually in, in, a, in a ridiculous manner. It's a little nod to that, uh, that pressure. Um, I haven't found the marketing part hard. I, I guess you'd have to, have to ask the, uh, the crowd at Goose Lane. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm not. Uh, how, how do I say this without sounding like a conceited pig? I'm not really easy to slot in. So sometimes people don't quite know what to expect. You know, there was a lot of surprise this time around. Russia? Why are you writing about that? It absolutely fascinates me. I lost the chat. Hang on. Um. Great. So how, how was your experience with rejection at first? Was it brutal oh. or were you lucky? <laughs> I won some competitions when I was a teenager. We have uh, something here in Newfoundland called the Arts and Letters Competition, and it's incredibly important. Um, I've adjudicated 40 the number of times to try and give back because it, it gave me a really big, big boost when I was young. And I was a bit of a smart ass in school. The academic things came really easily to me. I had a great time at university. So I figured I would just, you know, like any male writer on whom I was in, uh, on whom I was uh, modeling myself, the, you know, the, the whole Hemingway idea, which I really fight with. I was just going to naturally segue into publishing right away, probably by the time I was 19 or 20, because, you know, I was really gifted and really hot shit. And that didn't happen. Um, the uh, rejection really, really hurts. Uh, I'm getting better at it. I've got a much thicker skin these days. So, um, some people you know, you get to a point in your own work where you know you're competent 
And after a while, it's going to become a judgment call, whether somebody does or, or, or does not like your work. Rejections hurt. It is part of it. I still get rejections. Um, I recently got a writing grant from the Canada Council. It was only my second one in my entire career. I would apply almost every year, as Mike was talking about earlier. And obviously, the, adjudicate, the adjudicators didn't think the grant was very, the, the grant app was very exciting. Reject, 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 reject. So yeah, it has been brutal, but in uh, many ways, I think it's also been very good for me. Sounds a bit masochistic, doesn't it? Um, so Kurt, Kurt is asking, how does anyone define literary? I, I guess that's more of a comment on what you were saying, but <laughs> it, yeah. is, it is a question. I um, had to butt in, but I used to work at Indigo and <laughs> there's no there's no section for literary fiction there's a general fiction section yeah which i really <laughs> I, I really like that approach um, it's, it's I, think I, I think what i struggle with is this notion that there is can lit mm. uh, which you know it, i write historical fiction as well but i write it from a soldier's perspective mm. i spent 40 years in the military so yeah. for me telling a soldier's story i don't care about the plot i know what the story is uh -huh. and all the research you do well that's been my life yes so i can literally tell you how hard it is to get into the front seat of a vehicle when you're wearing all your battle rattle and sorry that's a, uh, all your your extra kit mm -hmm. uh, because the door is very small that and kind of detail is golden it is. Yep. And so the stories, the short stories that I tell are actually stories that other soldiers have told me and I've just imbued them with my my background. Mm -hmm. Problem I have is when I think of the Margaret Atwoods and the other Canadian storytellers that how does what I write, which is accurate fiction, mm -hmm. is that is actually truth telling with a little bit of literary license yeah versus something that you wrote which you pulled out of the air essentially i mean you've imbued it with all the historical accuracies that's required mm -hmm. but the actual story itself the relationship between the, the woman and the man yeah that's that's complete fiction mm -hmm. So, so how, you know, I'm stuck in the middle here. Uh, it's like, I'm looking at historic, uh, literary fiction as if it's some kind of a, um, I don't know, for lack of a better word, snobby mm -hmm. approach to writing. It can be. And yet what I do is sort of in the weeds, telling the story, the way the guys went through it, because I know what they've gone through and I've been on any number of tours. So I, I know, you know, that the sand gets into virtually everything mm -hmm. and how a smell will invade every part of your body yep. and it acts like a trigger when you come back i would think and so yeah. these are so that's where my fiction writing is but I, I don't know how i fit into the the literary scene in canada and whether i have any verisimilitude at all I wouldn't worry about how you fit in. That's something which you and I uh, in this present cannot control. You have golden experience. You are writing from a place of authenticity, which is really, really valuable. You have a vision. You know what you want to do. Kurt, bye. I'd stick with that. I like I yeah. envy you. I really do. Well, I don't envy the, the the horrible parts of your experience, but having lived that rich of a life that you can draw on for, for your fiction, that's yeah. that's pretty amazing. Well, I was talking to uh, uh, Jim, and one of the things I, I discovered about when I came back from Yugoslavia was that um, there is a rift between the civilian world and the military world. Yes, Most people have no concept of what we do. There is one comment here about uh, Gallipoli. Well, I mm -hmm. can tell you firsthand that, you know, I've walked that battlefield, mm -hmm. and I know that the Royal Newfoundland Regiment fought there. Mm -hmm. And on my tour, uh, the British came to the Canadians and asked for any member of the Royal Newfoundland Regiment to participate in their Gallipoli celebrations. Mm -hmm. And they were given, there was four people were chosen uh, because there was only four on the tour mm -hmm. and they were flown 
or they were transported over to the British lines and, and they drank their faces off and, and had a great time and, and then were brought back. And it was, this is because in Newfoundland, as you know, there are two Remembrance Days. Mm -hmm. uh, most people are unaware that July 1st, the morning is set aside. It is, For yep. what happened at Beaumont Hamel. Mm -hmm. And, you know, while the rest of us are out partying and have a good time, celebrating Canada Day, Newfoundland takes a moment to pause. And uh, uh, I forget where I was going with all that. <laughs> but the long and short is that, you know, it, writing history for me mm -hmm. is, is writing about what I know. And, uh -huh. and that's really the, the body of everything, really. That is a perfectly valid approach. Don't let anyone tell you different. Okay. Yeah. Now I just have to find an audience for it. Yes. <laughs> I think you will. Oh, yeah. That's okay. I'm actually sitting here writing about Rwanda. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's uh, brutal. Oh. Thanks a lot, Kurt. Yeah, um, thank you. Another question. Can you say a little bit more about writing dialogue for historical fiction? Hmm. That can get really tangly. Uh, I was saying earlier that the when you're looking at source documents, always remember that people didn't necessarily speak the way they wrote, especially if you're looking at like a formal letter or a legal document. No one was going around spouting Latin in uh, everyday sp speech, for example, in uh, in late Elizabethan England. Uh, I'm going to go back to my novel *This Marilla, to address that. Um, I kept the dial. I didn't. I kept the dialogue. Um, more or less as we speak, the big difference I have is that I did use the uh, intimate second person. So I do have thou and the uh, versus um, thou versus you in there. And the second, the intimate the second person is used in a very specific way. It's either with between two intimates, Marion and I would address each other as thou, or if I was telling off, if I was in a, a higher position of power and telling somebody off or even just addressing them, I would address them as thou, they would address me as you. When uh, the, the second person pronoun in, di in the dialogue in that novel is very important. It tells you what the power situation in a scene is. Other than that, I gave my characters um, idiolex, like each one has, has a few uh, catchphrases. Um, the main character swears his head off. Um, which, given the situation, he he he's in is is fine. I wouldn't struggle too hard to make it sound old fashioned. We we have no idea what people sounded like in 1760s Nova Scotia. There are no recordings. We can take an educated guess. Um, going over to Constant Nobody, Russian, uh, the the Russian language has that TV split. Russian still still uses a version of thou. English is one of the few languages which has dispensed with it to our loss. I might add. Now, initially, when my characters were speaking in Russian, I wanted to have the thou in there. And my editor just said, yeah, no, just, just stop. You're all overcomplicating things. And I initially disagreed with her, but I came to see that she was right. It was much easier for an Anglophone audience already reading something that would be theoretically translated back into English. Just, just put it in English and, and, and make it sound as, um, and make it sound like people speak. The biggest thing about dialogue in historical fiction is that you know your characters really well. You've got an idea of how they think and how they might react to things, what their voice would be. Just, just go with that. Okay, just a couple more questions. I guess these are the, the last two we have time for. Um, okay. This is more just a curiosity question <laughs> from Jim. Did you ever consider writing about the Gallipoli War? There's a legion called Gallipoli in Newfoundland. Many were deployed in Gallipoli battle in 1915. Uh, it is something which I've got ideas circling my head like planes waiting to land. Uh, it, it is something I'm interested in. Uh, I'm currently researching a lot of uh, World War II history uh, right now. Uh, my, uh, my maternal grandparents, uh, he was a Newfoundlander who served in the, Navy, in the Royal Navy. She was a war bride from North Shields, which is just north northeast of Newcastle, uh, and, and the Luftwaffe tried their best to bomb them off the map. Um, I feel... Um, Kurt, I think you can probably relate to what I'm trying to say here. I feel a great sense of responsibility towards this to try and get it right, because silly as it sounds, I wouldn't be here without the Second World War. I feel like, like I've got a, I, I really want to tell, tell the story and tell it right and try to make it as authentic as, as, as possible. Um, the Newfoundland Regiment in, in Gallipoli, um, 
like I said, it's something I'm interested in, but I, I, I don't have any plans for it, for it right now. Just, just trying to understand one man's experience in the forestry unit and then the Royal Navy in the Second World War when I had never served in the Navy. Um, I've been to sea, but that's about it. Um, that's going to be a challenge enough for right now. Yeah, if, if I may add to that, thank you mm -hmm. for being wanting to be authentic. One of the things that I yeah, I've got 40 years experience, but I also have a, a cadre of readers mm -hmm. who are ex-military or military. And one of the things that all of my writing is, it's all peer reviewed. Okay, it's yes. All, it's all absolutely accurate. That's very smart. Um, and the reason I do that is because there are somewhere close to 800,000 veterans out there <sighs> yeah. in Canada we all pay attention i have no doubt and out of respect i really for for what you have gone through in your service for what my grandfather went through for what all of you have been through i really want i want to get this as right as i possibly can i mean uh, if you had if you wrote a military story I, I would urge you to to have a military person read through it because they'll pick up on little things that you you just may not be aware of. you're absolutely right and i think i i thank you for that okay this has been great um last question from cole do you have any data on your reader demographics do you find most of your readers come for the history i have no idea <laughs> i'm sorry <laughs> I, I would think a lot of them come for the history for, for because they like history. Um, they might come because they're interested in Soviet history. They might come because they were interested in Christopher Merlo. I'm just grateful to have readers. Good answer. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, okay, so I think I think that's it for um, now. Cole says too true. Haha. -ha. <laughs> um, did you have anything that you wanted to close off with or anything you wanted to add? Uh, just warm thanks to everybody for coming and for your attention and for the really smart questions. It's, uh, it's, it is much appreciated. Thank you. And again, and thank you to you, Marion, as well, for doing all this organization. Thank you for coming. My pleasure.